Hi, so I'm Nancy. I'm here from the College of Science to welcome you and to introduce our program tonight. You can hear me now? Huh. I'm talking really loud. Loud enough? Because uh, this is as good as it's going to get, I think. I feel, I feel like I'm yelling. I have one announcement before I introduce tonight's program. The Society of Women Engineers is having an engineering extravaganza in March on the 23rd and 24th for high school girls in 10th through 12th grade. So if that might be of interest to you, the Society of Women Engineers will be out here in the hall uh, with um, exhibits that are lots of fun after the talk in here finishes and you can pick up more information and ask questions. It's always fun. Uh, so our program tonight is the first of a series that look at both art and science. So USU is, uh, is um, honoring the arts this year, having a USU Year of the Arts. So we thought it would be fun to get people who uh, use art in their science or use science in their art to do both art and science, who could talk about the way um, artists and scientists and art and science work together. Our speakers tonight are um, Lauren Lucas and Zach Gompert. And uh, they, Lauren um, has a background in both art and biology, which she's been interested in for a very long time. Uh, she studied both as an undergraduate and then continued on in biology, but still loves and does art. Uh, Zach Gompert uh, didn't start terribly interested in either art or biology to begin with, but then when he was an undergraduate, he did a biology research project and really got taken with biology and research and science. So he's continued on in that. Uh, they uh, both began working together when they were master's students at Texas State University, and they've continued to study butterflies using the techniques of art and science which is what they'll talk about tonight. So our talk will last for about 45 minutes, and at the end of that, there'll be time for you to ask questions. So when Zach and Lauren are done talking, uh, don't bolt out of the room quite yet. If you have to leave, leave quietly so other people can ask questions. And then uh, Zach and Lauren will tell you tonight about Nabokov's butterflies. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren, this is Zach, in case you couldn't tell which is which. <laughs> we are both evolutionary biologists and we mainly study butterflies. We've been working together for 14 years and we've been married for 10 years. We'd, uh, we'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight to spend the evening with us. So this evening what we want to do is talk to you about and explore with you the connections between art and science, the way in which these things play off of each other. We're going to do so um, largely through the work of Vladimir Nabokov, who was both a, an artist, a novelist, and who was a scientist who worked on butterflies. And we, in our science, work on the same butterflies he worked on. So we're going to show you uh, the science side of those butterflies through our own work as well. All right, let's start here, okay? We um, want to know what you think about the answer to this question. Are art and science opposites? We're going to give you a minute to discuss this with the people you're sitting next to. So if your answer is yes, wait for it, hold on. If your answer is yes, then you're going to chat about how they're opposites. But if you see some overlaps between art and science, talk about, describe the overlaps, okay? Don't be shy, take a minute, let's chat. All right, I know that was quick, but wrap up your conversation in a few seconds. Okay, I heard some great things while you were discussing this. Okay, a lot of which are included in our next few slides, right? So artists ask ethical, uh, aesthetic questions about morality, style, and beauty. Scientists um, address the factual status of the natural world, right? They test hypotheses, they develop theories to explain why these facts and not other ones um, characterize the universe. 
Since science is limited to the processes we can observe and measure directly or indirectly with tools, art and science are distinct subjects, right? And along these lines, scientists can help us identify problems and provide insights on what to do about those problems. But ultimately, it's up to us citizens, right, to decide on the solution. And as citizens, think under many different contexts, the arts, science, philosophy, religion, law, right? OK. But scientists, like I heard some of you say, scientists and artists are both creative both innovative, and creativity involves this complex interplay of you know, observation and imagination, for example. A rigorous application of techniques is also used by artists and scientists, right? Think about writers who adhere to the rules of grammar, for example. And both artists and scientists pay attention, or a lot of them pay attention to details, accurate details, and accurate details can be an inspiration and they can also be used to combat anti-intellectualism, right? Fine. Okay. At this point, we need two volunteers. But let me tell you what, whoa, cool, There's so much excitement. Let me, let me tell you what you're in for here. So as a volunteer, you need to feel comfortable in one of these cages for a couple minutes. <laughs> Wait, one more thing. <laughs> and wait. And you need to feel comfortable with live insects. <laughs> okay. Let's take. Let's have you come up, okay? Oh man, oh man. And right here in front. Okay. I'm so sorry, the rest of you. Okay. We will ask for another volunteer later, okay? So keep that in mind. I know, not yet, not yet. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have the volunteers get into their cages. First, wait, what are your names? Joseph. Yep, we have Joseph and? Brooklyn, okay. So you have to kind of crawl into your cage, right? It's already open. And be really gentle, because these cages are not, will you hold the, the side of that cage, Zach? Will you hold it? Okay. All right, volunteers, Joseph, Brooklyn, we're gonna hand you an envelope. And please hold, be very gentle with this envelope, okay? Um, you're gonna just hold the sides of the envelope and then you're gonna carefully kind of hold it maybe like a, a baby when you open the envelope. So you're gonna undo this clasper, open it up, and then you're gonna, let, you're gonna release the live insects, okay? And try to release them away from the, the door, okay? Try to get them to go all over the cage in a gentle way. All right. <laughs> so just hold it by the sides, okay? Go for it. Yep, open it up. Okay, be careful. There's, there's one on the bottom. Be really gentle, okay? You need to open it up. And don't step on any, okay? I'm not even going to move my feet. You're doing a great job. Feel free to come up and look if you want to. Are there more in that envelope, Brooklyn? Open it up really big. You got it all? Okay. You, you can pick them up and put them on the side of the cage if you want, okay? You should do it. Yeah. I can show you how. So you can just grab their wings. Okay, and you can move them. Oh, that one just fell out. 
Okay, Brooklyn. We want your. Okay, at this point, we're going to get the volunteers' reactions to this experience so you get a sense of what it was like to be in this cage. <laughs> okay, Brooklyn, will you tell me what it was like? What's it like in there? I was a little scared about what was in there at first, but then I was quite fine when I opened it. Oh, one's crawling on your foot. <laughs> Good. Okay, she was a little scared at first about letting them go, but now she's fine. And how are you doing, Joshua? They're cute. They're cute. Yes. <laughs> okay, at this, at, at this point, we're going to try our best to get our volunteers out of here without releasing butterflies into the audience. Okay. No, I got it. Okay. There's one somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. Sorry. We'll get it somewhere. All right. Now, audience. I know it's hard for the, for the rest of you to have seen the butterflies up close, but I want to get your reaction to this butterfly release, okay? So, did you all think, oh, hello, <laughs> what did you think? Okay, um, did you mainly focus on the beauty of what was happening up here? Um, or did you focus on more of the science end of things? Did you want to know what kind of butterfly was up here? Why were they were behaving the way they are? Why are they all at the bottom of the cage? Or did you think both at the same time? So let me do, let's do a quick poll. So there's no correct answer. Did you mainly think about the beauty of butterflies? Raise your hand. All right, we have some hands. Did you mainly focus on sort of the science of things? What were their names? Who are they, right? Okay. And how many thought both at the same time? Cool. Okay. So this, let me tell you their name. These are painted lady butterflies. This is a good one to know because they're one of, if not the most widely distributed species, butterfly species on the planet. They're found everywhere but, or every continent but um, Antarctica and Australia. Anyway, feel free to take a closer look after the presentation. But if you were here in this category, if Vladimir Nabokov was here, he would have felt the same way as you, right? Here's this great quote. I could not separate the aesthetic pleasure of seeing a butterfly and the scientific pleasure of knowing what it is. Another great quote along these lines is that he said is, there's no science without fancy, no art without facts. So, can you... So now I, I want to think a little bit more at this point about our friend Vladimir Nabokov. He's probably best known as a novelist, as an artist. Um, in fact, he was considered one of the leading, uh, most important writers of the 20th century. He had a fairly impressive upbringing. He was born in Russia right around the um, end of the 19th century. He grew up in there speaking Russian, English, and French. His family moved all over. He ended up in the United States. And it was more in that period in the United States that his writing career really took off. He's written books in both English and in Russian. 
and he has had a, a profound effect on uh, the literary world. And to give you a, a sort of feeling for how important he was uh, to literature, to give you a feeling of sort of some of the, the things he wrote, Lauren's going to read a brief expert, excerpt from one of his books, The Gift, just to give you a feel for his writing, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. All right, here it is. A huge butterfly, flat in flight, bluish black with a white band, described a supernaturally smooth arc, settled on the damp earth, closed its wings, and with that disappeared. This is the kind that now and then a panting peasant lad brings one, cramming it with both hands into his cap. This is the kind that soars up from under the mincing hooves of the doctor's well-behaved little pony, when the doctor, holding the most superfluous reins in his lap, or else simply tying them to the front board, pensively drives along the shady road to the hospital. But on occasion, you find four black and white wings with brick-colored undersides, scattered like playing cards over a forest path, the rest eaten by an unknown bird. So there are a couple of things that are common to his writing that come through there. One, his use of creative metaphors, and his generally colorful, vivid, exciting prose. There are other aspects of his writing that you may not get from those, those pieces, but one of those is that he generally developed really complex, intricate narratives. And part of this even reflects the way he went about writing. He had this really, uh, what I think of as a cool approach, where he wrote his stories not in a linear fashion, but he wrote them all on note cards to begin with, writing little pieces at a time, little scenes, um, focusing on little details as they came to him, and then arrange them all, put them together into narratives uh, only after the fact. He wrote 18 uh, novels over the course of his, his career, which spanned about the 1920s to the late 1970s when he, when he, at the end of his life. Um, some of the more famous ones are up there. They include uh, Pal Fire, Ada, Lolita. Again, about half, in, half of these written in English originally, half in Russian, then translated by him to English. Have any of you read some of these? Are some of these familiar to anyone? Few of you? So in addition to writing these novels, he was also a scientist. And in particular, he was a certain flavor of scientist. He was a taxonomist. Um, and a taxonomist who focused on uh, insects, really on butterflies. So before I talk about, about that, I, let me talk for a second about what taxonomy is so we make sure we're all on the same, same page here. So taxonomy is the branch of science that's concerned with the classification of living things. And it's a, it's a hierarchical structure that we use for classification that is generally designed or, or developed to reflect the evolutionary history of forms. And in terms of the hierarchy, um, let's just sort of walk through it for a second here. At the top level, we have these domains. The, the domain of, uh, that includes animals, plants, and, and, and fungi is eukarya. That includes our painted lady here um, that we just saw, a close relative of the painted lady, the red admiral, a heliconius butterfly, a butterfly we'll talk about more in a minute, Lysiades. Uh, here's a little seed beetle. Um, here we have Daphnia, a lion, and mushrooms. So those are all in eukarya. The next level down is kingdom. We lose the mushroom, but these are all still animals. We then have a phylum, uh, arthropoda here, which includes um, all of our insect um, friends, as well as the crustacean, the Daphnia. Insects are just our insects. We still have our beetle hanging on there. Lepidoptera are the, the um, butterflies and moths. We've lost our, our beetle at this point. And Phalidae is a family of butterflies. Lysiades is not part of that family. Then we have our binomial um, that gives the, the genus and species together, Vanessa cardii. Vanessa, these are both in the genus Vanessa. And then Vanessa cardii is just this the painted lady we were just looking at. It was this hierarchical structure of classification meant to reflect evolutionary relationships. Systematists are concerned with trying to classify individual species and, and delimit species according to this scheme. But what do you use to classify species? What best reflects evolutionary history? Well, the modern approach to this is mostly looking at DNA sequences. But Vladimir Nabokov didn't have DNA sequences at his disposal. He, was, he relied on other methods and techniques. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that now. <coughs> the group he really specialized on are um, the a subfamily of Lycaenid families known informally as the blues. One of his uh, groups he worked on most within that is a specific genus, Lycaeides, which is the same group we work on. Here are some examples of Lycaeides here. These are the males on this top little row in this box of Lycaeides or gyronomum are, are blue on top. And that blue is an iridescent pigment. In other words, it's a, it's a structural um, pigment that's uh, blue because of the way the light sort of refracts through it. Uh, on the bottom, the males and females have these patterns with black dots and these little colored eye spots that are called aurorae in this group. And the females are, are brown on top. 
So he was interested in classifying this group in particular. And the reason he was drawn to this group is because it was kind of messy. There was lots of variation in this group. And you could find things in different parts of, the, of North America, for example, that looked very different. But they tended to grade into one another. So it created a sort of a, a messy, complex uh, problem for classification where one could really get into and think about some of the details of the structures of these organisms. So you go out with a net, catch butterflies. He'd bring them back um, to, to the museum. He worked at a couple different museums over the course of his career, mostly before his writing career took off. And he would dissect them and examine um, various morphological structures, aspects of wings and other things, under a microscope. But rather than me tell you a whole bunch more about how he did this, we decided to invite Nabokov here. I didn't think he was going to show up because he's been dead for 40 years. But I did hear him outside the door. And I think he actually made it. So I'm going to invite him in real quick. Have him talk to you. Come on in. So here is our friend Nabokov. He's going to tell us a little bit about the approach he used um, to gather data used for classification of butterflies. Hello, everyone. I'm Nabokov. I'll be here today to talk with you about the butterfly wings. And the piece of equipment I'm going to be using is the camera Lucida. It's like a microscope, but there's a mirror on one side, and that mirror will reflect my paper up through the mirror into the microscope. So when I'm looking through the microscope, I can see the butterfly wing and my hand drawing on the paper at the same time. And that will allow me to make very accurate drawings so I can learn about the structures of butterfly wings. Thank you very much. Go ahead and have a seat. Um, Nabokov's going to begin working on one of these drawings. We'll continue working on it over the course of our talk. And we'll check back in with Nabokov periodically to see how the drawing's going. And after the presentation, if you want to meet Nabokov out in the hall, um, Nabokov can help you uh, make similar types of drawings. So um, the wing patterns, such as the one that Nabokov's working on, are one of the characters that he used to classify um, these organisms. He was uh, really uh, into quantifying and looking at variation and examined many, many individuals to make his taxonomic assignments. And he published his work in a series of peer-reviewed scientific articles. He published about a dozen of these um, over the course of his career, many of them on this genus Lysiades. And again, to give you a flavor for this, this end of his writing, Lauren's going to read another excerpt from one of his, from two of his scientific papers. All right, this first quote is, has to do with the method he used to describe the wing patterns. Um, OK, here it is. An extremely exact and simple method of mapping the wing characters has been suggested by the fact that the wing is crossed by a set of concentric scale lines of equal breadth. OK, so let me point this out to you. Uh oh, OK, there we go. <laughs> They vary constantly about 0 0.06 millimeters, sinking to 0 0.05 only in dwarfs, and rising 0 0.07 only in giants. Although a few of these lines may fork here and there, their curved course is, on the whole, remarkably regular and easily followed from costa to dorsum. This next quote is from a different paper, and it's describing one of um, the butterfly species will be focusing on the rest of the talk. Its name is Lysiades melissa. Okay, here it is. The typical form is weak fawn below in both sexes with well-developed and fairly distinct white elements, producing an impression of whitish buff, while the drab look of not too fresh specimens may have suggested the gray in Mead's notes. The pulvis, or pale blue, is rather conspicuous. So that's on this part of the wing right here. The macules, which are the black spots, uh, above average strength and size in both wings. The aurorae of average development in the forewing, somewhat reduced and isolated in hindwing, especially in the male. Thank you, Lauren. So that gives you another few of his, his writing. And here you'll see, although not as um, flowery, maybe, and descriptive as his, his uh, writing in an artistic sense, here he still is using very descriptive language and very much paying attention to the details, something that shows up in his art and science. And with that, uh, Lauren's going to talk more about those art-science connections. Some people have spent their careers answering this question how Nabokov was so good at both art and science. And some of those people said, well, it must be that his experience in the arts made him a better scientist and vice versa. 
But there are quotes out there from Nabokov himself saying that wasn't really true. So there's more evidence um, out there for this idea, right? That he, his attention to detail made him successful in both fields, okay? So in taxonomy in general, it's so important to have an attention to detail. Otherwise, how could you possibly, you know, notice the detail, you know, how could you possibly classify organisms to the correct groups, right? Now, Nabokov didn't so much deal with general theoretical questions in evolutionary biology, perhaps because he couldn't see the forest for the trees, okay? But certainly, um, his attention to detail was one major aspect of the way he approached literature. For example, it drove him crazy when other authors wrote about insects doing something somewhere where they didn't really exist in real life, okay? All right, speaking of his love of the details, <clears throat> he described, he named five subspecies in the butterfly genus Slyceides in North America. Okay, we haven't talked about subspecies yet. What are subspecies? So subspecies are subordinate to species. The subspecies name is tacked on to the end of the species name. So remember, Lyceides is the genus name Idis is the species name, Longinus here is the subspecies name. So subspecies within a species can interbreed with one another if they are put together, but they're usually not found together in nature because they're geographically isolated, okay? And so one of these five subspecies he named is actually pretty famous. It's maybe the most famous endangered insect or invertebrate at least in, um, in the US, its name is the Carner Blue Butterfly. How many of you have heard of the Carner Blue Butterfly? Oh no, okay, couple people, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it looks very similar to this, okay? And it lives in the New York, Illinois area, okay. And, but three of the subspecies he named were actually really challenging. They included intermediate or transitional forms, or in other words, uh, gradations between um, one species and another, okay? And we're gonna, our story here I'm gonna tell is about one of those challenging subspecies, Lyceides idis longinus. We also call it the Jackson Hole hybrid, okay? All right, so first, you have Lyceides idis up here. Its common name is the northern blue butterfly. It lives in Eurasia, Alaska, Canada, and the mountains of um, Western United States. Then we have Lyceides melissa, the melissa blue butterfly, and it lives in Western United States, Northeastern United States, up into Canada. Now, Idis and Melissa's ranges overlap in um, the central and northern Rocky Mountains. So on this map, the brown are the that's the Rocky Mountains, okay? And Nabokov found several populations um, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, so we're talking about northwest Wyoming, that looked like intermediates between Idis and Melissa. And he hypothesized that they look like intermediates because they were hybrids, right? The result of hybridization between these two species, okay? Something that helped him come up with this hypothesis was the wing patterns, okay? So let's take a second together. Let's squint at these wing patterns. Try to pick out differences, a difference or differences among these three groups. I'm giving you two representatives per group, okay? Hmm. So this volunteer is gonna help us place these three extra wing pattern pictures in the correct group, given whatever difference among the wing patterns you just found, okay? Who feels comfortable with that? Yeah, come on up, purple jacket. Yeah. Yeah, give her a hand, woohoo. Okay, we'll give you a moment to place these in the right groups. Okay, one goes under Melissa, one goes under Idis, one goes under hybrids. Okay, we'll hold these up for you. Put 
put some thought into it. Not too much thought. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it looks good. All right, there should be tape on the back there, so it should stick. And then here's your next one. Okay, can I ask you a couple questions? What's your name? Ada. Ada. So Ada, how did you make this decision? Um, so originally I thought this one was that one. Okay. But then I noticed that it's darker over here, whereas that one's lighter and that one's darker. So it has characteristics of both this one and that one. So it was a hybrid. And this one is sort of lighter near the edges and the spots are in different shapes and the big spots near um, in the orange are bigger than that one. So okay. that's how I made it. Cool. The things. My last question is, was this a hard decision to make? Uh, sort of. I was confused on that one, but I hope I got it. Okay. <laughs> okay, Ada, thanks so much. Let's give her a hand as she heads back. <laughs> All right. Let's reveal the correct answer. Uh, yeah, this one is correct. <laughs> and then these two need to be switched, okay? It's okay, it's okay. Let's switch these real quick, and then let me tell you, Ada, let me tell you why this is okay, that you didn't get it perfectly right, okay? This was a trick, pretty much. <laughs> Sorry I tricked you, Ada. Okay. So if you were to measure the size and the position of all of these black spots, all of these colorful eye spots on the wing relative to the wing size, okay, and did that for several wings, several individuals, for each of these three groups, and then you put all those measurements in a spreadsheet, and then you used a statistical analysis called a principal component analysis, <laughs> which collapses all those measurements, right, for each one of these things into fewer variables that explain a lot of the variation in wing pattern, okay? You get a graph like this, where there is, right, this collapse down wing pattern variable on this axis and another one here, they explain a lot of the variation in wing pattern. Okay, let me orient you to this graph. So there are tiny dots here. Each tiny dot is for one wing or individual. And the closer the dots are to each other, the more um, their wing patterns were similar to each other. Then you have these different colors, right? One color for each group, Lysiades group. Then you have these big circles, one for each group, that encompass most of the variation in wing pattern for that group. And then you have these bigger dots placed on the average wing pattern for that group, okay? So I want you to notice two things. One, those big circles are totally overlapping with each other. That means that the wing pattern variation across these groups is totally overlapping and almost impossible to tease them apart, okay? And then, but, but, the averages, these big points are not right on top of each other, right? So. They're different, but those differences are slight. And the biggest difference that you can pull out is between Melissa and the other two. So Ada got Melissa right. It's a little easier to tell Melissa apart from the other two. So Melissa has bigger black spots um, on average than the other two, and their black spots are a little closer to each other than they are in the other two, okay? All right, and Ada, here's another tidbit for you. Even the butterflies can't tell each other apart, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I want to show you this video from an experiment Zach and I did a few years ago where we tested the hypothesis that male mate preference for female wing pattern keeps these species, Melissa and Ida, separate from each other, keeps them from blending into one species, okay? So what we did was we had a nice camera, we took pictures of the females, 
We printed them out, printed out the pictures in an art studio on really nice paper, cut them out, stuck those models to sticks, stuck the sticks in the wild, and stood away from them and waited <laughs> for a male to come by. And indeed, we tricked those males into checking out those models. Some males even initiated mating with the models. Okay? So, in this image, right, this model here is a Melissa female wing. This female here is an Idis female wing. I'm going to play the video. Be on the lookout for the flash of blue. Remember, the males are blue. Oops. There's that butterfly. OK. So if you were out in the field with us, we all would have recorded that male preferred Melissa, then Melissa, then Melissa, then Idis, then Melissa, and flew away. Okay? <laughs> so we recorded data from as many males as we could across 10 populations. The story is that in eight of those 10 populations, those males didn't have a preference. In two of those populations, they had a slight preference for the female wing patterns of their own species. Okay? And then last, even, um, so Nabokov did describe the wing patterns for these three different groups, but really he relied more on a different body part to um, distinguish these species. Namely, these internal claspers that the males have that they use to latch onto the female during mating, okay? And so for Idis, these claspers are shorter and wider. For Melissa, they're longer and skinnier. For um, the hybrid, they're intermediate between the two in size and shape, okay? And so these are Nabokov's drawings. If you want to see more of his scientific drawings, Sam afterwards can show you. Where's Sam? Wave Sam, she's right in the middle here, yellow sweater, okay? All right, and there are other differences among these three Lysiades groups, right? The caterpillars eat different plants. They're found in slightly different habitats and they have different number of generations per year. All right, so let's check back in with Nabokov. Let's see how those drawings are going. Can't forget about Nabokov. <laughs> All right, some of it is a little hidden. So it'll remain a mystery. <laughs> we'll check back in with Nabokov again in a, in a little bit. But now I want to talk a little bit more about how our, our own research, our own science, is built on the, the science of, of Nabokov and the things he's done. Um, Nabokov and his wife spent many, many years running around catching butterflies. Uh, we've been doing the same thing for about the last uh, decade or so, um, working on this same group, Lysiades, and, and are building on his legacy he left, building on his questions, but asking some of our own things. In particular, our questions are less about taxonomy per se and, and more about evolutionary biology. But we still go to many of his own field sites, um, including a site that we sort of learned of uh, through him here in the southern end of the Tetons. So you can see our field crew coming up in the second working at um, this last summer or two ago. We, in fact, they found many of our sites from notes and maps that he's left. And we've been continuing the, some of the work he started. With our questions, again, being more about understanding evolutionary biology than, than taxonomy per se. In particular, um, we have done some things thinking about validating some of the classifications Nabokov has made. In particular, thinking about whether the things he thought were hybrids, or those, these things that look like integrades, were in fact hybrids. We've also asked questions um, about the evolution of this group of butterflies, thinking about how we can use these butterflies to study the origin of species, and thinking about how these beautiful wing patterns have evolved and changed over time. Uh, our methods also sort of have built on some of the things that, that he's done. Um, we no longer need to, to draw, although Nabokov is here, the pictures of wings in order to analyze them. Instead, we can use microscopes hooked up to computers and cameras to directly image wings, like the wings we see here, and like some of the wings you'll see 
popping up here to give an idea of some of the variation we've captured, which Megan, who is in the audience, Megan, over here, can help you take pictures of wings afterwards if you're interested in doing so. We also now rely a lot more on molecular DNA sequence data to understand the evolutionary relationships, the classification of these, these butterflies. We have access to a wealth of details and information that Nabokov never could have even imagined having. With this information, we've been able to validate many of the things that Nabokov thought. He's been inc right incredibly often, although he's also been wrong some. For example, in terms of rightness, his classification of the Connor blue turned out to be spot on. In fact, they're the most distinct thing in the whole group, the subspecies he named, and should probably be a species if anything in the group is a separate species. It also turns out that he was totally right about these things in the Tetons and Yellowstone being hybrids. So we've gone through and we've um, use DNA sequencing to look at the underlying DNA sequence of many, many genes on different chromosomes across the genomes of many, many of these butterflies. Lysiades itis, Lysiades melissa, and these Jackson hybrids, uh, putative hybrids. Now, you have a graph here highlighting some of that data I want to just walk you through briefly. As you move along the bottom, you're looking at different individuals with Lysiades melissa on one side over, over here, Lysiades itis on this other side, and this Lysiades itis longinus, these possible hybrids in the middle. If you move up here, you're looking at information on a bunch of different spots across the genome on different chromosomes of these butterflies. Wherever it's dark blue, an individual has both of its gene copies that were inherited from Lysiades melissa. Wherever it's light blue, they have both copies inherited from Lysiades itis. And the intermediate blue means they got one copy from each species. If you look at these um, two good species, they're mostly all dark blue or light blue. The hybrids have this crazy mixture, a mosaic of bits and pieces of their genomes coming from the two different species, just like you'd expect if you just smash those two genomes together. So yes, they're hybrids. But beyond that, we've been able to tie those patterns of variation, of, of DNA sequence variation in these hybrids to different traits, like the internal clasper traits, the wing pattern traits, and begun to identify some of the traits through what's happening in the hybrids um, that may have been important for pulling those species apart to begin with. We've also been um, thinking about the wing patterns, as I mentioned, about the evolution of these beautiful wing patterns. In particular, we want to know and we want to understand how much the in inherent constraints to the developmental pathways or the, the genes affecting these, these traits constrain the ways in which these, these wing patterns can evolve. Is it possible that any wing pattern can exist? Or are there certain ones that, that can happen or other ones that can't happen? Is evolution limited? Um, are there only so many ways to make a wing pattern? And we've tested different hypotheses like, oh, all these black spots have the same developmental pathway and they all have to evolve together. And these colorful spots can evolve separately. Or maybe there's more divisions like you see here in this hypothesis too. Or maybe it's a front versus back wing thing. Well, through recent DNA sequencing and, and measuring the wings of many, uh, over a thousand butterflies, we've been able to show that really it, one of these two stories is basically right. That evolution can only make big, the black spots bigger or smaller all together. And the same thing with the orange aurorae. And those same differences, that variation you see within species extends to the divergences you see between species. So we can see how there's limits to what can be done in terms of evolution and how that plays out over longer periods of time. And at that point, let's uh, check back in one more time with our friend Nabokov and, and see how his beautiful drawings coming along of those wings. That's looking nice. Why don't you pull it down a little bit so they can, we can see how it's, looks nice. Guys. Uh, oh, whoops, yep. <laughs> Look at what we have or here. Can you move the scope, Nabokov? <laughs> Just get that mirror out of the way. <laughs> Look at that attention to detail. Look at those intricate details Whoa. of the wing pattern. <laughs> So the old technology still works as well to capture those wonderful wings. And we'll, we'll look at it again. You can come up at the end, which is coming soon, to look at it once questions are over. So for Nabokov, uh, beauty was truth, right? He found so much beauty in the variation that exists, that exists across individuals within a species. And this variation you can find within any species is fodder for evolution. 
And over longer time periods at larger scales, that variation, those details that you see within species get rearranged and shuffled, kind of like Nabokov's index cards when creating stories. They create this grand diversity of life we see in the same way that you can imagine shuffling bits and pieces to get to a, a more complex narrative, a whole story in a picture, um, bringing sort of these connections of art and science together. We um, would like to take any questions you might have. Questions? Yes, we got somebody in the front. At what point do two organisms become unique species as opposed to just the same species? I'm gonna, I'll, I'll repeat it and I'll answer. So the question, am I on? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to wait once so people. By the way, just one second for a few people to clear out, then I'll, then I'll repeat and answer the question. So, so the question, <laughs> so, so the question asked was, when looking at DNA sequence data, how can we tell whether two things are actually different species or just the same species? This is a really, really good and hard question. Um, so there are, if you have, the, the gold standard these days for things being different species is whether or not they can interbreed, right? And that is still probably the most common definition of species. But there's a gradation between being able to easily interbreed to being able to not interbreed at all. And often we can't even access that directly because it may even depend on conditions. So it's often instead that just differences are used. In this case, when I'm talking about, for example, the Carner blue being a different species, the reason why I think that's a reasonable thing to do is that it's more different from anything else in the group that it, that, than any other pair of species in that group are from each other. In other words, if we make, keep things consistent, the things that are already called different species in the group differ by some amount of DNA sequence divergence. These guys differ more. So if they're a good species, Carner Blue is too. But whether and to what degree they can interbreed, we don't even really know. They haven't been the crosses made. So it's a sort of a relative decision. Um, but it really is a hard thing. There isn't, there isn't as good of a gold standard for species as maybe there could be, but part of it is that the evolutionary process is inherently continuous, and there's not necessarily a strong discontinuity between the same species and not. It's a gradation, so where you draw the line is, is somewhat arbitrary. I often liken it to thinking about, we all know a five-year-old's a kid and a 30-year-old's an adult. Where is the, but, we, but at some point in time, you have to cut it, right? You're a kid, you're an adult. It's the same thing. You can say, okay, those are different species. These aren't, but there's a gray area in between. Other questions? Right here in the blue t shirt. <laughs> How many butterfly species are there in the world? Do you know? It's, it's over 6,000 that have been named that I'm aware of. And there's many, many more moths than that. The number for moths is much larger. And yeah, in the back. We're going to catch it in a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> in the front. Butterflies, and what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? So the butterflies, there's a couple things that tend to be different, but they're, they're, the simplest thing is that all the butterflies are more closely related to each other than they are to any moths. So it's sort of based on their evolutionary history that you can really classify them. But there are general differences in the structure of the antenna between butterflies and moths that you often see. Um, there are differences in the way they generally so, rest with hold their. On. So the antennae of the moth are fuzzier. Yep. Yeah, they have nice fuzzy antenna. They're not so much in butterflies. They have kind of like a club ending. And you, and, and, and in general, right, most butterflies, so, almost all butterflies are day flying, <laughs> whereas a large number of moths are night flying. So there's things that are different on average, but um, not so many things that are a clear cut distinction. The antenna might be the, the cleanest one. Oh, Nabokov's drawing the different butterfly um, antenna. It's butterfly versus moth. <laughs> Will you label them, Nabokov? <laughs> butterfly and moth. <laughs> Perfect. That's <laughs> the antenna difference. <laughs> Next question. Yes. How many butterflies are in the 
and our personal collection. So we don't really have very many butterflies across many species. We have a handful, but we've collected many, many Lysiades. Um, we for call, yeah, we, for our research, um, this, the genomics research Zach talked about, um, we collect on the order of 600 butterflies a year, and we store them in very cold freezers to preserve that DNA. So yeah, we're more Thousands. specific to this, <laughs> these species we talked about today, not so much about the vast diversity. Oh, got somebody over here. Yes. Oh, let us know oh, if you yeah. remember. Yes. Sure. In the back. I don't know that people know that. I've heard, I've heard various stories about it, but I don't know if any of them are true. Um, you think you have an answer? So, give her the microphone. <laughs> yeah. I concur with Zach that the answer is not necessarily known for sure, but one of the thoughts is that a lot of insects use polarized light, so light that bends to navigate. And so normally they're navigating by the sun, which is so far away that the curve is almost a straight line. But when you've got a light bulb that's really close by, they start trying to navigate as if it's the sun, but instead they just start circumnavigating the light bulb as if they were trying to circumnavigate the globe. So the curvature of light from the light bulb causes them to think they're going in a straight line, but they're actually just going in a circle. Thank you, Nabokov. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. He named five subspecies, and he named a handful more species, I believe, on the order of a dozen, but I can't give you that, I, it may, plus or minus a few. Um, and he named a whole genus, too. There is, yeah. And he's had at least one named after him. So he has a, a whole genus named after him, and he has a subspecies of Lysiades named after him, Nabokovi. Although they might be gone. Extinct. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? In the back middle. So that's also a really good question. So one, so it's, it's a tricky question in the sense that um, in addition to um, potential evolutionary change, so his, you know, his collections are from the 40s and 50s. We're now, you know, we're talking about 70 years later. But there's also, um, wing patterns are also affected by environment. So, there's, so if you just compared the wing patterns, it could be that we're looking at environmental differences, not just genetic differences. Oh. But one of our, our main goals that we didn't talk about much is we're, we, we've been collecting time, like, gen, data every generation for a good dozen generations and a handful of sites. And we're trying to get access to his old specimens to do the sequencing and to basically identify genes affecting wing pattern and then ask whether those have changed. Because then you can sort of remove the environmental component. Um, ask us in five years. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a few things that are different. Not so. There's one life history thing that's kind of related to what you're asking. It, um, the Lysiades idis and the hybrids all are what are called obligate hibernators or obligate diapausers. You get one generation a year. When the eggs are laid, the caterpillar stays inside the egg until winter's over. Lysiades, mostly you can, they can come out right away and you can get multiple generations in a year. Another difference is that Lysiades melissa in particular is often tended by ants. So they'll um, secrete this sort of sugary solution like aphids basically and ants will protect and defend the caterpillars and it um, has a big effect on survival in the caterpillars. You don't really see that in the other Lysiades species. You see it even more in other members of the same um, subfamily. Some of them are so closely tied to ants that the ants actually um, get tricked into bringing the caterpillars down into their mounds and feed them um, instead of feeding their own offspring. But if you had caterpillars from the gr three groups right in front of you, it would be in. They're all green. Yeah. Little green they caterpillars. They all look identical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, uh, how's climate change affecting your species? Affecting their habitat, their viability? It, I mean, the answer is it's really complicated and hard to say. It's one of the things we're kind of looking at in a sense, and again, we're collecting a lot of data every year on these butterflies to monitor both um, demographic and evolutionary change. Uh, we'll have 
a cleaner answer, I think another decade or two even. Uh, I can say though that the demography is definitely tied to the uh, climate patterns. So whether it's a wet, dry, wet year, dry year, wet summer, dry summer, all those things have a major effect on host plant availability, the length of the summer. Um, so it's going to affect them exactly how drying is bad in general, right? They do what you, what butterflies do best when there's a good amount of moisture early and things stay sort of moist, but when you get a nice warm summer in the end, so you need a good snowpack to begin with, you need lots of moisture in the ground and enough uh, moisture throughout the year to get a full season. Some of these recent really dry years, it's been really sad and there's been basically not much out there. Um, so dry, dry hot years are not good, which means things are probably going in a bad direction. And they're really, really dependent on their host plant too. Um, so they're very much tied usually to one or a few species of hosts. This is one of the big problems with the Carner Blue, is around one plant. And that plant has a very specific habitat. As the habitat's gone away for the plant, the bugs go with it. Um, so it's usually just a few species they'll feed on and lay eggs on. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the sort of... Will you repeat the question? Yeah, so why do some monarchs live a very short amount of time, and why do some of the, um, the broods live a long time to these big migratory uh, events? And it's how they're allocating resources is sort of the short answer. And at certain, life, at certain stages, they need to live that far, and they're making trade-offs on how they're investing their energy so that they can extend their life. Um, like most things, is if you're going to... You can burn through resources quickly or slowly, and it's going to affect how... Yeah, with, with, the right, with the right developmental switches happening, right? So by the time they're adults, it might be that you can't shift them one way or the other, but there's, it's the same genome, right? It's the same genes, it's all this, it's the same stuff. It's being turned on, affected in certain ways based on signals, and they're shunting resources in one way or another. All right, at this point, I think it's time to enjoy oh, yeah, the after activities. Yeah, and, and come see Nabokov's drawing before Nabokov takes it out to do more drawings. And thank you all.